Hello and welcome to the Tough Girl Podcast, which is all about motivating and inspiring you. I'm your host, Sarah Williams. Just a little bit more about me. I completed the Marathon de Saab, six marathons in six days across the Sahara Desert in April 2016. In 2017, I threw hiked the Appalachian Trail, 2,190 miles in 100 days, which I also vlog, so you can go and watch every single vlog on YouTube. In 2018, I completed my Master's in Women and Gender Studies, and I cycled the Pacific Coast Highway and Baja California solo and unsupported, which is over 4,000 thousand kilometers there's also vlogs and videos of that journey on my youtube channel as well so please do go check that out the tough girl podcast is sponsorship and ad free thanks to the monthly financial support of patrons find out more about supporting the mission to increase the amount of female role models in the media please do go check out patreon p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com forward slash tough girl podcast there's currently over 220 patrons who are supporting the mission be sign up now and become one of them All patrons will get their name on a dedicated patrons page on the Tough Girl website. All female patrons, $5 and above, are invited to join the closed Facebook group, the Tough Girl Tribe. And all patrons named will be entered into the monthly prize draw so you can win awesome prizes. So please do go check out patreon.com forward slash Tough Girl Podcast. Today I'm delighted we're speaking to Shamilia Koestani, the former captain of the Afghan women's soccer team. My name is Shumila Kostani. I was the former captain of the Afghanistan Women's National Soccer Team. I mean, the first team that was ever established after the fall of the Taliban. I was one of five women who established and created the national team for the first time in the history of Afghanistan. Can you tell me more about your love of football and where it came from? Yeah, so when I was really young, I always wanted to play sports and I was I was mainly a tomboy because I came from a family of seven women, just one brother. And, you know, growing up in a conservative society like Afghanistan, where um, gender roles are very defined. And as a woman or a young girl, um, there are limits to what I could and I couldn't do. And I always was told, you know, not to play sport. You're a woman or you're a girl. Don't do this. You're a girl. Don't speak too loud. You're a girl. So there was a lot of like anger issue. I would say that I had inside me. It's because that um, because I was a girl, my opportunities were limited on what I can, I couldn't do. So after the fall of the Taliban, when women had a little more opportunities, you know, to go to school and be able to play sports, I um, chose to play football because I would always play with my brother um, and my yard when we were young. And I also picked football because it has a lot of running, you know, it involves other people, teamwork. It was very physical. Because that was one way for me to get my anger and frustration out and do something that's forbidden by our society and is challenging. So I could prove a point that young girls or women are capable of playing sports if opportunity is given to them. Absolutely. So I started basically playing soccer or football because of that, because I wanted to do something that has never been done. And I hated that, um, you know, the society and people put those social norms or gender norms there that restricted me from doing what I love to do. When did you start to realize that actually I am being, I'm not allowed to do so many different things because of society and because of gender roles and what was expected of you? When did it, when did it start to become apparent to you? Honestly, this is something that I knew that I didn't like it, but I didn't know why. Like, I never questioned it because in our society, you don't really ask your parents or elders, why can I do that? They just say you're a woman. You're not supposed to do that. It's not proper for you to do that. But I didn't notice, like, although I was responding to differently, I wasn't happy with it. I always did things that I was not supposed to do. But I didn't realize it until old. when I got much older. Oh, this is why I was always angry. Oh, this is why I was always frustrated. This is why I never liked to dress like a girl because I saw it as a weakness. But at that moment, 
I didn't know it. You know what I mean? I didn't know why I was doing what I was doing. It was just a reaction to everything that I could observe in my society. Like I never put makeup on. I was like, it was a sign of weakness to me. Or I never cried because when I got in a fight, because I would always say, oh, people think I'm weak. It's because those things were always associated women as something that you have to look down on. But I didn't know that until later on I realized that, oh, this is what it was happening to me. You mentioned the fall of the Taliban. What was that like growing up during that period of so much change? Yeah, so I mean, that's uh, one period that is, um, you know, I could never remove it from my mind or ever forget about it just because being a young girl with my six sisters and it was such a hard time for my parents because women were not allowed to play sports I mean forget about playing the sports like we weren't even able to get um, an education have our basic rights um, so women's basic rights were taken away from them all I could do was stay at home 24 hours and they really devalue women in the society the way they described the woman's role is just to make babies and clean after a man and stay at home um so it was really hard and challenging for my parents I mean especially for my parents because you know they have seven girls one boy and they can provide us the basic education or opportunities to succeed and it ha- applies to a lot of other Afghans too. Um, even for men, the situation was bad too. It's not like they had better opportunities. Yes, they had more freedom, but life was just that miserable for them too because they were left alone to provide for their families because women weren't able to work. When did school play a part of your life or when were you able to start going to school and start getting an education? So when the Taliban took over Afghanistan, I was on third grade. So I missed almost five years of school. And I went back to school in 2001 when the um, Taliban fell apart and the invasion of America happened. Um, So because I can go back to third grade, I'm much older. So I was lucky to study at home with my older siblings because they were in upper classes and helped me to kind of stay still study at home with the few books that we had. So I was able to take exams to kind of escape fourth, fifth grade and then go to sixth grade. And then from there, I studied sixth grade and then I took summer classes I skipped seven and I went to eighth grade so I was able still to graduate when I was 18 but it's because of a lot of studying throughout the year because I missed so many years and I didn't want to be behind and because I missed so many years of school for me going to school was like like I felt like I was going to have it every day like there was no way I'm gonna miss it like if my sisters, my parents were like, hey, can you take off today? We are like miss one because I had school and then I had two time courses outside the school to keep up and catch up with everything. They would be like, do you want to miss one time course today? We, you, we need you at home. And I would be like, absolutely not. I'm going to school. I'm going to my classes. So like sometimes my sis, older sister will get mad. Be like, I just don't understand. How could you not be able to miss one day? And I always have to remind them because I missed five years. Like I have no interest in anything else to stay at home and, you know, do other chores. I just want to go to school. Let's talk more about the football as well. So you went back to school in 2001, but then in 2007, you helped to establish the first Afghan women's national football team. Could you talk more about that journey and to how you ended up establishing the, the national football team? Yes, uh, when I started playing uh, football, there was only a few girls who all played, um, like, you know, in their backyard or um, maybe at the schools. Because, you know, a, a lot of schools wouldn't allow women to play certain sport because um, they consider it very physical. And also, they basically don't have the space either. So when I contacted the football federation um, uh, saying, hey, I want to play football, do you have a football team? 
And of course, this is the first time they hear a woman calling them and asking for, um, you know, if there is a woman is um, football team. And the coach at that time said, nope, but you can come to the federation and we can talk about it, how to establish it, because you're the first woman who contacted us. We are interested. So we usually like we need you to kind of help us with this. So I went to the Football Federation um, and I walked into the Federation and a lot of the people who saw me, men men mostly, they thought that they saw ghosts. They're like, oh, ma'am, you're in the wrong place. Who do you need to talk to? And I was like, no, 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 I'm supposed to be here. I have a meeting with this coach. So they were all in shock. So I next thing you notice, I'm in a room full of like 25 men. I'm the only woman. And I have to explain why we need a woman's team. Um, so it was very welcoming, but at the same time, very strange for them, you know, uh, because they never seen women playing uh, football. So what we did is that in order for the Football Federation to be able to access young girls to encourage them for playing uh, football, we have to work with the Ministry of Education to get access to women through schools, because that's the only way you basically get access to women, which we did. And we established um, the Football Federation basically reached out to most of high schools and Kabul mainly in the city. We established um, the first um, football team in the schools. And then from there, we, so this was all happening between 2002 to 2006 and early seven, where in 2007, we had our first um, games, or I would say, um, you know, we organized a festival where I invited all the teams from Kabul, from all the high schools to come play. And then that's where we picked the national team from there. This was more to kind of establish the basis of the national team. And also we invited media to kind of put it out there that the Football Federation now has women's team and there are practices in different high schools. So it's like promoting ourselves, but at the same time telling people that such a thing exists in Afghanistan now. Oh, Shamelia, that is just incredible like oh my goodness the change that you have brought about is is amazing I mean what an incredible thing to do I'm sure you must have come up against lots of obstacles or challenges along the way how did you get past them how did you keep going to get to that point in 2007 where you had a national team so much. Um, yes, it was definitely a long journey. I would say a challenging journey, but definitely worth it because, um, of course, we were challenged by society, by even our government, by the people who work at the Federation because, you know, not everyone was welcoming. At the end of the day, it's a conservative society and, you know, gender roles are very defined even today, especially at, um, I'm speaking of like 18 years, 15, 12, 15 years ago. So not everyone is welcoming. Yes, everyone is excited about it, but the thought of having women, you know, have the team run around was not something that people are going to accept easily. So most of the time we practice, we practice indoor. We did it in a gymnasium. We had our first matches all in gymnasium. Even the first festival that I described earlier, it was all inside. So it was similar to futsal, basically. We didn't go outside immediately, you know, in open fields to compete or play. We had to take our time. Uh, because we didn't want um, a strong reaction from the society or we didn't want to be attacked directly and called Western, you know, West, that this is because of Westerns being in America. We wanted this to organically develop within our society that we are behind it, the women of Afghanistan, the Federation. It's, it doesn't have like a um, foreigner influence, which was true you know but we had to make sure um that that's how we want to develop it because you know sometimes there are conservative people that immediately starts running campaign against you 
uh, using religion, specifically using religion as a weapon to kind of attack women and, you know, discredit us for everything we have achieved. So for that reason, we had to take a s- a smaller steps to establish the team. I mean, there were times that, I mean, myself, where I lived and where I would go for practice, it was like two hours bus ride and I have to switch the bus three times and then I had to walk for 10 minutes to get to where I need to go just for like an hour of practice um, every other day. I mean, all the players, the women, they all took that kind of challenges and risk, even security-wise. Because we wanted to establish the team, we wanted to basically, um, you know, define our role as young people in our society, what we wanted to do, who, like, where is our place? So this was one way for us to kind of work on um, identifying ourselves with the national team, with the football team, that women are strong, women are capable as long as we give them opportunities. Um, this this is why we accepted the challenges and we were able to fight back. And, and what was happening f- for you as well? So you're playing football, you're you're getting educated. What were your dreams? What were your goals? What did you want to happen? Uh, I played for the national team for two years, so we had a lot of trainings, you know, um, outside the country, not only about soccer, but also like, leadership trainings, how to play within a team and um, how to be a leader in your community. So I traveled a lot while I was in high school. And when I graduated, um, of course, I always wanted to get my go to college. But the opportunity was um, very limited back in Afghanistan because I wanted to go to school outside the country. So I better understand, you know, um, the word and like I want to have that international um, education. And when and one of my trips to America, where I used to come for a soccer camp, you know, different programs um, through state department or different nonprofits, I met a teacher who I was working at a boarding school, and I told her that one of my dream is to come to school in America. So that's how I basically applied to that college where she helped me high school. I came here for one year of high school. And then from there, through networking, where, you know, I was able to get into college. I graduated. So then I went back to Afghanistan. I tried to work there for a year. Um, didn't work for me. Things were very, very different than I left security situation was worse since 2008 so I decided to come back and stay here until things get better back home what about your family what about your sisters so my family is back in Afghanistan still um some most of my sisters are married I've never been to their wedding (laughs) not I haven't met a lot of my nephews and nieces but I met uh, a few of them. Um, so they all went to school, got education. Um, some of them still live inside the country. A few of them live outside the country. Are you able to go back or not able to go back? I am, but um, I wasn't for a long time, mainly for security reason. Um, because, you know, when I came to America, I played at college level and I wore shorts and stuff. So it caused a lot of issue back home. Um, and then my parents told me not to visit often just because they were worried about something may happen to me. Um, but then I went three years ago because my dad was sick and I went for two weeks. I haven't been back. Um, and that's again, mainly for security reason. Um, my parents, are worried and says, we want to see you, but I would rather you be safe. Well, absolutely. That's getting me emotional. I must be so tough, like, to to, to handle that. It's very hard. I'm not going to lie. I mean, it's been now almost 11 years I've been away from home, and my parents haven't been a part of my life. Of course, we talk on the phone, we Skype, but you know what I mean, they miss my high school graduation, they miss my college graduation, they miss my wedding. It's because there's a lot of things that I wanted them 
to be a part of, they weren't. And even when I went back to see them after like five years, three years ago, it was just very emotional because, um, you know, I could see how much they have changed, but I wasn't a part of that change. So it was heartbroken for me. Yeah, I, I can't even imagine. Are, are you still playing football at the moment? Or, you know, what do you do to keep healthy and active? So I work out religiously every day. Um, sometimes if I have time, I even work out twice a day. Um, and everyone makes fun of me why I do it. Again, it's because, you know, it's a way for me to kind of, you know, when people are stressed, they eat, they go have ice cream. I don't know. For me, like working out is a part of my daily life and it makes me happy. It makes me feel better. I sleep better. Like There are so many things I can say. Why? So that's why I work out a lot. I unfortunately don't play as often. I coach some once a year at a soccer camp, which is a leadership soccer camp that is run by a former U.S. women's national soccer team, like former captain Julie Foudy. But I don't play because I have two ACL surgeries. I'm a little worried about, you know, turn it again. I want to be able the, to hike when I'm 50. And I still have my knees. <laughs> Absolutely. So you were captain of the national team for two years. You said you went on some, you know, leadership courses. Tell us more about what was involved in that role and tell us about some of the matches that you played. Yeah, so during the two years, we didn't play a lot of international games just because our team was not in a place to do that. We were a new team. You know, we received a lot of trainings, like we went to Germany, we went to Dubai, like I came to America a few times, but it was basically to help us, um, you know, understand how other countries um, have the national team or in general, people are playing the sport. So we're meeting different faces that give us like hope or inspires us how we can build our team moving forward. Um, and we played actually our first game after establishing the national team with the Pakistan women's team. They had a league and they invited us so we went play with them. So that was the first time that uh, we actually won the league that um, year. So when we went to back to Afghanistan in 2008, we were welcomed at the airport by like hundreds of men and young boys. And that was the first time we both looked like my teammates and I look at each other. We're like, what is happening? <laughs> we were not expecting that. Um, and I think it's only, it's also because we were playing Pakistan, which historically there has been always tensions between the country. So even when we played our last game with them, we had way too many Afghans, um, supporters, fans at the stadium in Pakistan and Islamabad, which was, you know, amazing. Um, so that was an experience that I always remember how welcome we were uh, back in Afghanistan. But since I left, I think the team has done great work. Um, they have been you know, competing internationally, I mean, at the Asia level uh, for many years. It's just very unfortunate because, um, you know, in Afghanistan, things are still not um, better for women in a sport, especially because a lot, there's not a lot of investment. There is uh, very little opportunities and resources available because, women are still fighting to um, establish themselves as capable athletes. So that's why currently the team is in a mess. I'm sure, I'm, I'm not sure if you have heard up about the recent allegation about the president of football federation in Afghanistan that was harassing women or sexually assaulting women. So that is a very big setback right now for the team. And I am in touch with some of the players and we are hoping that we come out of this much stronger. But still, um, the even the government, the federation, they don't really take women's football as seriously or women in the sport as seriously. 
just because they consider women as second class citizen. So a lot of the work that has been done is very symbolic, just so we can say to the international community, yeah, we have women as football. Yeah, we have women as basketball. But actual serious investment hasn't been done. Yeah. What can what can we do? What can people do to help, to support? I think um we have to like keep something in mind because a lot of you know for the past 18 years there has been so much money that goes to Afghanistan and a lot of people think that that could be the prop you know like we can solve the problem like that and I don't think that's true because you know issues like with the football team or women in a sport in Afghanistan, it needs to be addressed at the grassroots level. You know, the foundation is weak. No matter how much money we are giving to this federation or the Olympic, it's not going to help women directly um, because a lot of those money gets invested towards men's sport. I think um, at the grassroots level, we need to, work with um, federations or at the Olympic level or Ministry of Sport where they truly have a specific budget for women. They give women access to the gyms. They have programs for women the same way that they have for men, you know, that it gets happen. It doesn't get delayed. We have access to all these resources that men have. This is how the, a change is truly going to happen. If we are investing in men and not investing in women, and we're not giving women the same opportunity or young girls as we are giving young boys, we are never going to succeed. And women are never going to excel, and we're going to remain where we are. So that's my problem. Federations need to seriously take women's sports seriously, and they need to have respect for us. Otherwise, like it's not going to happen, you know. Yeah. Did you watch the did you watch the World Cup? Yes. Every single game. <laughs> <laughs> what did you think of it? What I mean yeah, what were your thoughts on it? I think this World Cup personally was very, very empowering to me, very inspiring to me in so many levels. Um, not only because this was the first World Cup where women were really promoted each player and there was a lot of respect around um, women's football so that's why I think it was a very it's going to be a very memorable World Cup and the teams also played very very well and during this World Cup it was kind of obvious to see why certain teams were really good and other teams weren't. And I was very happy to hear a lot of newspaper kind of wrote about each team because it really gives you the perspective of, um, you know, a different perspective looking into women's football, why some teams are at the highest level, but other teams are not. For example, like Argentina's men's team is so good, but the women's team, yes, they are good but not as good, but why is that? And you hear about, you know, their federation misusing fun, not investing in the women's team. It's because of the lack of respect for women's football. Same thing with Brazil, same thing with Chile, you know, that even the teams that were able to attend this World Cup, it's because they wanted it so bad. They fought with their federation. They fought for resources. It wasn't just give it given to them but then on the other hand you see the youth women's national team how well they perform i'm not saying that the opportunities are are you know perfect for american women or they have everything but with what they had you know was better than other teams around the world and that's why they are they won the world cup so that was very clear to see and i truly enjoyed it and it was also like to see players how good they are from each team despite losing and winning to see to the highest level they are competing their skills and their leadership in general on the field and off the field is amazing because i read a lot about each one of them and you could see that they were not just football players they were great leaders within their community 
they were highly educated, a lot of these players, and that made me very happy and inspired me. So can you imagine how many uh, women or young girls has been inspired around the world watching this World Cup? I think it comes down to the importance of having visible role models, people you know, women especially being able to see other women playing this, playing sports and it getting the recognition that it deserves. Exactly. In terms of role models, who are your role models? Who who do you look up to? Who's inspired you in, on your journey? So when I started playing football in Afghanistan, um, and I'm going to be honest with you, I didn't know that women um, are playing football around the world and there are um so I could choose to have them as role model, but it's because they were never promoted on social media or even interviewed, you know. So everyone who I look up to was mainly um, men um, as role model. But it's because that's what I hear all the time about. That's who I see on the news. So when I came to America and I met the U.S. Women's National Team, a lot of the former former players and also, like, um, a lot of athletes in general from different sports. And I was like, oh, wow. I was, like, amazed. And I was inspired by each one of them to see, you know, that how capable they were, how strong they were. And to see them compete at, like, that highest level, like, I was just amazed. It, lo- it totally changed my perspective as a woman or as a young girl, what I wanted to do. So for me, um, in 2006 was my first trip in America, not my first trip, my second trip. And that's when I met um, Julie Foudy, who uh, who is the former U.S. national team player. So she was, for me, she became my role model because I could see that, you know, she's highly educated. She played at the national team. She had win gold medals and she's a good person and a good leader so there were so many things about her that inspired me and moving forward like you know um i would always tell like even a lot of young girls nowadays they you know their role model is always a man and it's because you know the society kind of structured things in a way where that's where you are shifted to think those are your role models where we have so many amazing women in different fields, not only sport, that, you know, has made history. And I like to always tell people, like, those are the people that we should look up to as role models. We need to kind of, you know, change our perspective of who your role model is. Absolutely. So you're 30 years old. You've been through such a huge amount in your in your life. Looking forward into the next 10 years, what would you like to see change? What what is what would be your vision for the future? One thing that I'm uh, looking forward to see is in the world for women, especially in the football um, world. I want to be able, I'm hoping that before, you know, in the next 10 years, I will be able to see Women are getting paid equally, women are getting treated equally, and women are appreciated equally and are respected for everything they do for our society. Like, that's my big vision where I personally want to see myself. I want to be in a place where, as a woman, no matter what part of the world I am, I'm seen as an equal member of that society and I wanted to contribute equally because I want as a person despite my gender I want to feel equal to you know other people in the society I know this is a big vision it may never happen but that's where I want to see myself in the future to be a part of such a change Absolutely. And Shamila what advice and tips would you have for other women out there who are going through a challenging time, a challenging situation, who are having to take things slowly, having to take baby steps, who don't know they're ever going to achieve what they want to achieve, but they've got to keep going for it. What advice would you have for those women? I would say that, you know, most often when we are um, facing a challenge or when we have issues or problems, we just assume that we 
we cannot just you know get help and there's no way to solve this but i would always say like you know when I started playing soccer, you know, I didn't know what challenges I would face and I didn't know how to address it. So I just moved forward with the flow as it happened. And it's not like I had computer or access to internet to Google how to address something. I mean, people have more resources now available, especially young girls. So if you if you feel like you are challenged or you have any problem, please reach out to your peers. There is a bigger network that network of women now that supports women um like reach out to them there are so many ways you can get help but just don't get stuck to that issue or challenge and assume that you will never get out of it because i often see some people where they say they complain constantly about the same thing for the past two three years and in my head I always tell them, but you're not doing anything to change that. Or you haven't done anything, according to my opinion. All I hear, you're unhappy with this. But you need to focus on, it could be a little a steps you can take that it may not make a change at that moment. But it may address the overall problem in the future. Just take those baby steps. Just make little changes in your life that would address the bigger problem. But you can't just you know, assume someone will take care of it and you solve this whole problem or a challenge at that day. And, you know, complaining, it's just, it's just not worth it. Like nothing happens. You've got to take action to make, to make change. Exactly. And if you keep complaining, believe me, I have certain friends and I'm like, okay, this person always complain, but she's not telling me what she wants to do about it. So like people eventually get tired of it and they don't even want to be associated with you. Yeah, 100%. And Jamila, where's the best place for people to find out more information about you, to read your blog, and to keep updated with your journey? Yeah, I have uh, my own website where I write about the impact of sports um, on women and how it builds confidence. So it's uh, my website is shamila.kohistani.com. So if you Google that, my first name, last name, my website will come up with that has all my information and people can reach out to me through my website or social media. Shamila, thank you so much for coming on Tough Girl Podcast to share more about your journey, the challenges you faced and overcome, and you're such an inspiration for other women out there. Thank you so much for doing what you do. It's, it is so inspiring. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to share my story. Um, I'm very happy to be speaking with you. Absolutely fantastic to speak with Shamelia. What an incredible woman. What an inspiration. Everything that we've talked about during this podcast can be found in the show notes at toughgirlchallenges.com. So this episode came out on the 4th of August 2019 and it is to help celebrate the fourth year anniversary of the Tough Girl podcast. So the Tough Girl podcast was started on the 4th of August way back in 2015 with four episodes. So I decided so I decided to celebrate this year by having four episodes go live on the 4th of August. So you can also take a listen to my solo episode where I answer questions from the Tough Girl Tribe. I reflect back on 2018, the beginning of 2019 and the plans for the future. We've also spoken with Paula Radcliffe, who is the fastest female marathoner of all time and has held the women's world marathon record in a time of two hours 15 minutes and 25 seconds, which she's held since 2003. During that podcast episode, we talk more about her career, her passion for running, dealing with injury, becoming a mother, and what she's up to now. We also caught up with Mel Nichols, Paralympian, endurance and adventure athlete, and the hand cycle le jog world record holder. So Mel was a fit and healthy young woman. She loved to get outside, go running and ride bikes while looking after her horses. Unfortunately, after a series of life-changing strokes, Mel's life was turned upside down. She was unable to walk after her third stroke in 2008 she struggled to use much of her left side of her body however fast forward four years and after watching the Beijing Paralympics from her hospital bed Mel was racing in front of 
80,000 people at the London 2012 Paralympics. At this point, Mel had only been involved in the sport for 15 months. So Mel has gone on to break the two-hour time barrier in the London Marathon, and she recently smashed both the men's and women's Le Jog World Record, hand cycling 874 miles in six days, 22 hours and 18 minutes. So we have a whole host of amazing episodes coming out today and also every single Tuesday at 7 a.m. UK time. Bonus episodes come out on a Thursday at 7 a.m. UK time. So make sure you subscribe so you don't miss out on any of the amazing content coming out. I do just want to say a massive thank you to all the patrons and supporters of the podcast. I wouldn't be able to release these episodes. I wouldn't be able to increase the amount of female role models without your continued financial support. It really does make such a massive difference. So a big, big thank you from the bottom of my heart. If you want to help to motivate and inspire the next generation of women, then please do go check out Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com forward slash tough girl podcast. Thank you so much for listening. And I'll be back with you next Tuesday for another awesome episode of the Tough Girl Podcast. Take care, lots of love, and I'll speak to you soon. Bye.